Duke laser disc repair. This is anterior cervical endoscopic spine surgery used in the treatment of a herniated or bulging disc. You can see from the MRI image on the bottom corner of your screen that uh, this patient has a disc herniation bulge, small disc herniation. All of the disc herniations have an annular tear in the back of the disc and hers is at C4-5. Everyone agree? She has symptoms more to the right side, so we're gonna go in on the left to reach over and make sure we get the right side. Our patient is asleep. She has her face here. Can you see that? No. You don't see the face here? No, not really. You don't see the drapes? I mean, we do, yes, yeah. yeah the face <laughs> is here. <laughs> I apologize. This is the neck, and her chest is here, and the rest of the body is down this way. So I'm going to start by placing a needle into, oh, we're going to start by giving our patient a little more muscle relaxation and putting her sleep a little deeper. So right now you can see I touched her throat. She's gagging. <laughs> My anesthesiologist is trying to cheat me out of the anesthesia. <laughs> I got to give Dr. Berndes a hard time. So but by the way, if you ever wonder what a gag reflex looks like, that's what it looks like. Uh, and a cough. I think we got a gag and a cough, right? Two of the brain brainstem reflexes. Burned as? Yes, I agree. Okay. So the cough reflex is 10 and 10. Is that right? Cranial nerve 10 and afferent and cranial nerve 10 efferent. And then... Uh, Gag is what? Ten. Gag is 12? Yeah. So gag is 12, 10 and 12. What we mean is the sensory side, uh, the, the nerves that trigger the reflex that get stimulated are cranial nerve 10. And uh, ones that go to the muscles that cause those reflexes are cranial nerve 12 or 10. Let me know when you're ready. You sure? So. <laughs> now I want you to understand when I learned this technique, it was from the South Koreans and they actually had the patient awake. So the patient would gag and cough like that throughout the whole surgery which to me is not acceptable, it's too risky. All right, so what we need to do at this point, it's much better, thank you. I need you to put her head in slight extension sure. because as I'm pushing down, sure. her spine is kinking forward and kyphosing because her head is ro rolling like this. Okay. So keep her slightly extended. All right, we're gonna get started. We've given some more muscle relaxer, right? Yep. I can feel the spine. I'm gonna go here. Seems to be responding a little bit. Shot. All right, two, three, four. It looks like I'm at five, six. I need to be a little bit higher. We want to be four, five. Everybody agree? Shot. Two, three, four, five. We need to be a little bit more north. She has a very nice neck, by the way. I'm just, I still feel her spine moving backwards. Shot. Shot. Yeah, I need, I need something to keep her from flexing. Shot. That's looking good. Shot. AP. Quick AP. Let's see where our needle is. Quick, quick. Don't set up all the way. Just get in there and get a shot. That looks good. Back to a lateral. So I'm actually displacing her um, trachea and esophagus medially. Shot. You agree, North? Shot. You agree, Luis? AP quick. That's at four five. Everyone agree? Four five. Four five is where we want to be. Yes. Lateral. That's perfect. So we're right in the middle. Dead center shot 
You can see how I've pushed the esophagus way over. Did you guys see that AP view? Go back to the AP. Sean? Go back to the AP view, just so our, our viewers can see this. It's pretty incredible. Quick shot. Look, we're going to show you the trach in esophagus. Okay, good. Now save that picture. Go back to a lateral. Look at, look, at the, look at the esophageal tube, the braided tube, way over. So we're pushing the esophagus, displacing it very far to the side. Shot? All right, so I can relax my hands for a second. I want to verify my disc that I'm in, and that's called localization. Everybody agree we are at two, three, four, five? Everyone agree four, five? Yes, Me too. All right, let's do a coker AP, a coker AP. So we're going to do another AP. You're going to see now the esophagus and trachea come back towards the midline quite a bit because my hands are no longer pushing them. See that? Well, the esophagus tube is still way over to the side, so that's pretty good. All right, we're in the midline, which is where we want to be. You always want to check two views when you do this, the front back and the side to side. We call it a true AP and a true lateral. And my fingers are truly hurting. These cervicals hurt my fingers really bad. All right, I'm going to advance this. Shot. Perfect. So we are now inside the C45 disc. Let's count. Show our audience number two, three, four, five. So that's two, three, four, five and the disc we're in is the four or five disc and that is the disc on MRI that has the herniation that's causing her her pain her symptoms okay we're going to do a discogram now and we're whoops Luis you didn't tighten it on <laughs> really that's all right you you're having water issues today <laughs> Can I have more, uh, we may be okay Never mind, we got enough. <laughs> no, it wasn't on. Shot? All right, there it is. <laughs> okay, so that's impressive, folks. Look at that. Look at the dye in the epidural space. Show them the epidural dye. Yep, all that black right there is because dye leaked out from the disc through a tear in the back of the disc. Show them the tear. That's the tear right there. So the dye literally went through the tear in the back of the disc and into the epidural space. Show them the herniation. The herniation is a, a, a like a, right there. It, it's devoid of dye. So the dye is highlighting the herniation. So you see how the dye has a like a indentation, a concavity? That's actually the herniation in the back of C45. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Love it. So exciting to see this, this anatomy and understand it. So unfortunately, most of this stuff went all over me. <laughs> uh, Luis, you're too funny. All right, I got to get you back, Luis. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to get you back, all right? So, a little water fight in the OR. Everyone's misbehaving. Anyway, we do a little local, and I'm going to... The problem is the dye is very sticky. So I need to get it off my gloves, otherwise everything will stick to my gloves. And we're not going to use this local anymore anyway, so. Thank you, Luis. That's good. A little sterile water uh, hand cleaning. And any questions, feel free to type them up. Um, the reason we broadcast live for you all is so you can learn. And part of learning is watching. Part of learning is asking questions. Let's see the lateral. So ask questions, watch, and listen, and learn. I get to learn too, because when you ask me questions, I learn what kind of questions you ask. So feels good. We're ready to make our incision. This is a number 11 blade. I'm making a four millimeter incision. Of course, we hit a vein. Take. Shot. Looks good. I'm just going to hold pressure for a minute. 
So a lot of people have veins under their skin. You see them often when people get angry or excited because they valsalva and then all the blood from their head slows down going back to the heart. And this is a superficial vein just under the skin. Impossible to avoid or predict. Um, but we're just going to hold pressure for a minute while it clots off. Thank you. All right, we'll take any questions you might have. And while we're waiting here for a few minutes, why don't you go ahead and start the video on why do herniated disc or bulging disc cause pain? Traumatic injury on the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissue develops within the annular tear causing neck pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause worsening symptoms. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to the nearby nerve roots, causing arm pain. Pain signals travel up the nerves to the brain, causing localized neck pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of neck pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc in neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Welcome back. And just so you know, we put a little vein pressure on the vein and it's, it's stopped 80%. Go ahead. Um, at this point, we're gonna bring the dilator down from the outside world where we are in through the neck and down to the spine. Shot? How many Red Hot Chili Pepper fans do we have out there? Me. Oh, good. You got good taste in music, man. Are you a Metallica fan as well? Yes, I am. One of the first bands I was able to play drums to. That's awesome. Shot? Unfortunately for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, they were around when Metallica was around with their newer albums and they didn't stand a chance. Nobody did against Metallica. Not even Guns N' Roses. None of the glam rockers had a chance against Metallica. There we go, that's perfect. So we're right in the middle of the spine at the front of the disc. Even people who didn't like rock, you can't help but like the rock of the 80s, you know? Like All the rockers, everything. Journey. Yeah, Bon Jovi and Warrant and Rat and everybody, you know? Yeah, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Cinderella, great band, Great White. I mean, so many good rock bands from the 80s. They don't make rock anymore, dude. It's so sad. The kids these days, you listen to their music and it all sounds the same to me. Just unfortunate. We have a couple questions. All right, we're happy to take your questions. We're just advancing this dilator in the disc to the back where the tear is, but go ahead. First question comes from Andreas on YouTube. Hello, Andreas. And they ask, can a herniated disc at C2 through C3 uh, be fixed with this procedure? Any uh, difficulty beca uh, because it's a high level? No, Andreas, awesome. Can you lower the music just a little bit? It's a little bit too loud. Um, Andreas, great question. Can a C2, 3 disc be fixed with this method? The answer is 
Yes, I've done it once before. Um, that just shows you how rare C23 herniations are. They're not common. Um, they represent less than probably two per thousand symptomatic disc herniations in the neck. But yes, I've done it before and you are correct. There is a chance I would not be able to do it because it's so far up there. It's really hard to reach. And it honestly just depends on your jaw, the, the angle of the jaw, the mandible, and um, you know how thin your neck is versus thick. It, let me just say, if you had a really thick neck and you have a, a low jaw, I would say the chance of getting it is small, being able to do it is small. But we would never, be able, we would never know if it can be done until you come to the operating room and we put you to sleep and we relax you so your muscles are all relaxed and I can do my best to get up there. I would say off the, just off of what I know about normal anatomy and you know, getting up to two, three, I would give it a 50-50 chance of being able to reach it. And if you have a good neck and anatomically, like a thin neck with a uh, you know, spine that's anterior and a, a short jaw, like look, look at this patient right here. Show them the jawline. So you see that jaw right there, the jawline, and come to the angle? Yep. Right there. You see how it's above C23? Show them C23. That's, show them the 2-3 disc. That's the 2-3 disc. So you see, I could probably get there on this patient. So this is an example of a patient I'd be able to get to 2-3 and fix it. But there are patients where the jaw is way down at C3, and I wouldn't be able to do it. Is that a picture? Yes, sir. Shot? Shot. So it all depends on your anatomy. And I can't just say yes for sure because I don't want to say yes and then be wrong. So I give it a 50-50 without knowing anything else about you. But if you were this patient today, I could do it. But you're not. Because if you were, you wouldn't be asking questions. You'd be sleeping here. I'm just being silly. But you got to be silly sometimes in life. Because if you're not silly about life sometimes, life could really get you down. All right. I was supposed to hear from Dr. Patel, by the way. Can someone call Patel's clinic and see what's going on over there? Eighty twenty one, eighty twenty one. Uh, Patel knows. I want to know the result of a test that he just did on a patient. I'm curious. All right, folks. This is time to ask your questions of Dr. Duke Majin, the founder and CEO of Duke Spine Institute. I'm here with my A team in the operating room. We're doing a single level, one level Duke laser disc repair, which is a transdiscal anterior approach to the front. Um, it's not percutaneous because we're actually making an incision and putting a tube. A lot of people get confused about that. Percutaneous surgeries are those done through a needle. We're clearly not using a needle. Did you talk to him? Oh. You're sure about the extension? Eight-oh. And we're actually going transdiscal, which is like, just think of trans-Siberia and you go across Siberia, but this is transdiscal. Just means to go across. So we're going across the disc from front to back to get to the back and fix the herniation. Well, I need to know the result. Are they calling us back? All right, fine. Yeah, we're 843, 0843. Oh, All right, so folks, we're gonna head down the rabbit hole into the disc. When we poke out the end, we'll be at the back of the disc where the herniation is. See the air bubbles? All right, we are at the back of the disc.
This is where the tear is that we saw earlier. Piece of herniation right here, I'm zapping away. Look how it's turning a golden color. That means there's calcium inside the herniation. Don't make a mistake. This is not a calcified disc herniation. A calcified disc herniation is something very different. Somebody asked me about that earlier today. The calcified disc herniations are very rare. And this is not a calcified disc herniation. This is just calcium inside the disc herniation. Okay. Well, those are fibers of the PLL. You can see the herniation right here. The main part of the herniation has gone right through the PLL. And you see all the pink color? That's inflammatory tissue. So clearly this thing is causing a lot of inflammation. We saw all that reddish pink color at the beginning. There's herniation right there. Wow. Incredible. Right there, you're looking at it, folks. That is the her main part of the herniation. See how it's sitting in the epidural space? It literally went through the PLL. Those are fibers of the posterior ligament right there. And it's ripped the hole and it's sitting right on top of the spinal cord. No wonder why this, there it is, bam! So cool, you all see that? <laughs> I love this surgery. No fusion necessary. Man, it's so sad that these surgeons are so far behind the times. If they could just do this so simple, it would save people so much pain and suffering. Let's show them the herniation. Turn on the light. Now, it looks big, right? But it's really not that big. Get the light on. Look at this thing. That's got to be about two millimeters by, well, two millimeters by two millimeters. I think there's going to be more than that. It's kind of hard. It's a little hard. So it's not a calcified disc herniation. No, no, no. Just, I mean, if they don't call in five minutes, we got to call back. I mean, the whole purpose of doing the test was to find out right away. Anyway. Look at that, that's where the herniation was sitting, right there. It looks like there's still a little more in there. So we're gonna get in there and get to it. Um, I didn't ex expect uh, you know, to see this, to be honest, based on our MRI. That's why you cannot trust an MRI. MRIs don't show you the details like you see with your eyes. MRIs are just an indirect picture um, using a magnet. Look at that thing, that's a pretty good size herniation right there sitting on the spinal cord and the nerve on the, her right side. That's got to be why she's having all that pain. So I'm going in. Well, what do we find out? <sighs> Would you get Dr. Patel on the phone? Yeah, please. Sorry. Let me know when you have him. Man, that is a big tear, guys. That's a huge tear in the back of this disc. Uh, I, I'm surprised. I didn't see it that big on the MRI, man. That's, that's why you don't go based on MRIs ever. You go based on people's symptoms, what they're experiencing. So sad that, doc oh, there's another piece that came out. Look at that. There's, we call that a reverse herniation. We coined that at Duke Spine first people in the world to call it a reverse herniation, but there it is. Is he on the phone yet? Why don't we go ahead and cut to a, a video. What does the Duke Laser Disc Repair do? How does it work? Why is it so revolutionary? Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic neck pain. The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. 
a small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, just working away here. I hope you enjoyed the video and see what we do. The Duke Laser Disc Repair does a removal of the herniation and it cleans up the annular tear. That's what I'm working on right now. We've had two large pieces of herniation so far. I'm gonna pull back a little and look over to the patient's right. Oh, there's another one. Anybody have any questions? If you do, type up your questions. I'd be happy to answer them for you. That's why we do live stream, so you can ask questions during surgery. We have a question from Facebook. This comes from uh, Judy Nicholson. And Hi there. And she asked, uh, do, you, do you all know that the uh, Queen Elizabeth has passed away? Yes, we heard that Queen Elizabeth passed away. I just found out. So very sad day. Very sad day. Um, That's my mom's twin. <laughs> shut up your mom's twin. Queen Elizabeth passed away, we, we just found out recently, like literally I think a few hours ago. Um, she was getting up there. I honestly thought she was gonna live forever, um, only because it's amazing how healthy she looks whenever I saw her on TV. Of course, Queen Elizabeth is the Queen of England. Um, and Probably one of the last true noble people. You know, noble in every sense of the word. Just, uh, I didn't know her personally, of course, but um, very sad day. One thing I can appreciate, she had difficulties raising her children, and so do I. So it goes to show you, even when you're the Queen of England, you can still, teenagers can still cause problems for their parents, right? No one's immune, even the Queen. Oh, yeah, that's my mom's twin. That's your mom? <laughs> she doesn't look like the Queen of England. Have you looked at the Queen of England with your eyes open? What nationality is your mom? British. She is British. She looks British, but she doesn't look like the queen. I'm sorry. Where does she live? Oh, get out of here. Have you been imbibing? I'm just kidding. Um, well, it's wishful thinking. By the way, that's the spinal cord right there. Right there. The laser's touching it. And uh, you can see some inflammation right there, the red stuff. That's on top of the spinal cord. We're not going to mess with that. These are fibers of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And my God, what a view we got, huh? You don't see this with any other type of spine surgery. We have a, yeah? I'm sorry? Okay. Oh, I can't hear him. I I, so, can you ask him if her butt pain is gone? The butt pain is completely gone. And the calf is the same. Okay. All right, then it's got to be the veins. Uh, tell her she needs to go to get the vein study tomorrow morning. We'll call her with the time. Thank you. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So, I mean, I wouldn't do it personally, but that's up to Dr. Patel. He needs to make that decision. It's his decision. 
Me personally, I would go get a vein study before we do anything else. Because I have a feeling we're barking up the wrong tree. All right, questions? Yes, we, uh, we have multiple questions. This first one comes from a name in Russian that I uh, won't pronounce. I'm sorry, uh, uh, forgive what me. What kind of name? Uh, it's a Russian name, I, I can't pronounce it. Russian, oh, <laughs> give me the spelling. Oh, M M I X A H A mix a That's Russian. I don't. Uh, it it looks Russian. Now I'm looking really closely. It may not be. I just. I don't think that's Russian. It's just weird text. Excuse. So. All right. But anyways, they their question was, what precisely is the herniation that is popping out, and uh, herniation in quotes. What precisely is the herniation? That's, is that correct? Is that yeah. what I understand is the question? Yeah, what precisely is the herniation that is popping out, is what they asked. Like, those, like is, are they asking the reverse herniations or the original herniation that was popping out? I would, I would say the original herniations that are popping out. Yeah, all right. So a herniation uh, in the human body simply means a tissue that is moving out of its normal position and passing through another tissue. And it would be considered a herniation, okay? So we have hernias, like inguinal hernias, where your intestine is moving through the abdominal wall through a defect, and that's called a hernia. But in the spine, a hernia is referring to when the nucleus propulsus, the jelly in the center of the disc, passes through a tear in the wall of the disc, called the annulus fibrosis tear. That's the herniation. The herniation is the jelly itself, not the, the wall. So it's the jelly that's moved out of the center of the disc, passing through the tear in the back of the disc. That is the herniation. By the way, this is all scar tissue here. Uh, in the right foramen at L, uh, C45. And this is some herniation in here and scar tissue. And I'm trying to see if there's any more herniation left. This is going out into the foramen right here, where the nerve root is. We're just superficial to the nerve root, anterior to the nerve root. But I don't see any more herniation there. We've gotten rid of it all. We need about one minute or probably two minutes more, doctor, and we'll be done. This is more in the middle of the spine right here. This is going off to the right side. This area is the foramen. And this is where the herniation was sitting. The big one that we took out, the two big pieces, was sitting right here, just to the side of the, the, the center, called paracentral. And para means next to, central, paracentral, next to the center. And this is all scar tissue from inflammation, this white stuff. You see the calcium on it, the gold? This has been here for a while, probably years. This poor woman has suffered for years. All right, we're, we're pretty much done. Uh, there's a little bit of tear right there, I think. I'm going to clean that with the laser. Clean it up there. See a little bit of herniation right there stuck in the tear. That's why I wanted to get out here laterally and clean that up. If you leave this, the tear won't heal properly, so it has to be cleaned out. This is called the annular debridement. And once again, this is what I pioneered at Duke Spine and the first in the world to do it. And this is what gets rid of their pain and lets the disc heal naturally without fusing. Duke Spine Institute is the first place in the world to do the surgery. We, we, we did it 16 years ago for the first time. And we've been doing it for the last 16 years. We've published the results in the medical journals. It's been peer reviewed and published by neurosurgeons. Uh, and we've published multiple times over the years. It's a very safe surgery. All right, let's see. We are just about done. I'm wrapping up right now. Uh, and then we need about another minute. And then um, I'm going to come and answer any questions you might have. So feel free to type them up for me. You said you had multiple questions. So let's get the ones that we have answered. We got that one, and the next one is from Urban Boredom on YouTube. 
and they asked. Well, hopefully they're not bored watching the surgery. <laughs> Hope not either. And they asked, uh, hello, Dr. Duke. Thank you for your time. Um, how Pleasure. Do Pleasure is mine. Uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that you don't go too far posterior and not injure the dura? Yeah, great question. So the question from Urban Boredom is a great question. How do I make sure I don't you know, go too far and injure the dura or the, you know, the spinal cord underneath it? Um, so the, the most important thing is to know your anatomy. And you know, when I was learning to be a neurosurgeon, even before I started studying anatomy in medical school, and I became very good at neuroanatomy. I was the top student at USC in neuroanatomy. As a matter of fact, the school, USC invited me to teach as a faculty neuroanatomy to first year med students when I was a fourth year med student. And that was the first time they ever did that. And as a matter of fact, didn't they just invite me, they actually paid me to be faculty, um, which was you know, the first time in the history of the school. And they paid me, you know, to be honest, $30,000 for the year, which was a lot of money, obviously. And it, it covered my tuition. So basically, I didn't pay tuition my fourth year of med school at USC in Los Angeles because I was a faculty. I was teaching. Thanks. So um, anatomy. I, was, uh, I fell in love with neuroanatomy in med school my first year, and I became really good at it. And so knowing your anatomy, knowing where all your tissues are, knowing where the bones are, where the disc is, where the annulus is, and knowing all your layers between the tissues, that's really understanding anatomy, like what nerves go where, what muscles attach where, what um, tissues are where. This is a piece of herniation too right here. So you know, knowing your anatomy is so important in, becoming, in being a good doctor and a good surgeon. So they teach anatomy, you know, very important subject matter in med school. Very, very important. They get, you have gross anatomy and you have histological anatomy. So you have the anatomy of organs and that's gross anatomy. And then you have the anatomy of microscopic structures called tissues and that's histology. And then of course you have cellular biology which is the anatomy of a cell. So you're learning anatomy in med school and then having that understanding of anatomy is very important. So what helps me to avoid injuring things is to have a really strong understanding of anatomy. And honestly, you can't be a, a good surgeon if you don't understand anatomy. But there are unfortunately a lot of surgeons that don't understand anatomy and they get into trouble because they don't understand anatomy. So, you know, that's number one. I know where the dura is. I know where the back of the vertebral body is. I know where the abnormal structures are, like this is abnormal. This is all scar tissue. So as long as you know where the normal and abnormal things are, then you know what to avoid so you don't injure the, the spinal cord. Um, the laser itself, literally you have to almost touch things to get it to, for the laser to, to blow it, you know, to vaporize it. So just being near it doesn't do anything. It actually has to to get very close, all right? And if you're not close, you're not gonna, it's laser doesn't do anything. And of course, I could injure this patient's spinal cord with not just the laser, but with also the tube. If I shove the tube down, it could go into the spinal cord. And so I'm very careful with how I hold the tube, how I move the tube. I'm conscientious and aware of it all the time. All right. I think we're just about done here. I don't see as much herniation in there. And we've already done the other side, the right, the right side. There's a little piece there. We'll get that guy out and we'll be done. I need one minute. So um, knowing your anatomy and you know, being very careful. And neurosurgeons are trained to be very careful. We work within millimeter and half millimeter spaces easily. See this, that, that glass fiber right there is half a millimeter. So using that half a millimeter uh, measurement, you can understand that I'm actually taking away, a t oh, there's a herniation. Just came out of the foramen. See, it's a good thing we stuck around. My instinct told me we're not done. So, and that was, by the way, the, uh, the pulse wave of the laser shooting. 
pushing that thing out. There's no luck involved, if that's what you're wondering. This is not a get lucky surgery. Um, this is a very, very precise. There's another herniation just came out. There, this is a very precise and calculated procedure. Um, I do it the same way every time because I believe once you figure the right way to do things out, uh, do things, you should repeat it the same way every time. Once you, once you find a recipe for success, you've all heard that, right? Recipe for success. What that means is do it the same way every time and then you'll get the same results. So that's what I want. I want the best results every time for my patients. So I always do it. This, I figured out what the best way to do it and I just do it the same way every time. Okay. Now all this stuff you're seeing is just little fuzziness, little scar tissue, little pieces of herniation that are pretty much stuck down near the nerve. And I'm literally peeling it off about a tenth of a millimeter per pulse with the laser. Just a tenth. That's a very thin, thin, thin uh, amount. So I'm just very careful. I guess, you know, that's why I don't damage the dura spinal cord. And the patient's not moving. Remember I talked about that earlier. The Koreans were doing this surgery with the patients awake and moving around, which I think is a really bad idea. All right, we're done. I don't see anything else coming out. I've cleaned the tear up quite nicely, and we're done. By the way, our first two patients are doing fantastic. They've both gone back to their hotels. Remember, one was from Washington, the other one from uh, Nicaragua. And they're both very happy and gone. And uh, we'll see them tomorrow, hopefully, for some uh, testimonials. We haven't been doing many testimonials lately because we've just been short-staffed and just haven't had the, the man and women power to keep up with uh, those type of things. But uh, I think tomorrow we're going to be ready to do it. And we'll have some patients who want to do it. I suspect. Okie dokie. I'm going to show you this just so you guys can see. Can you guys see this tube in here? Yep, we can. So I'm going to take the fluid adapter off. And I'm going to show you guys right here. Pretty cool, huh? You see that? The whole surgery was done with this tube. So this is truly minimally invasive. When I have surgeons, they tell me, Oh yeah, I do minimally invasive surgery. I laugh at them, but I laugh to myself because it would be rude if I were to laugh in their faces. <laughs> right, Luis? <laughs> but I just let them go on believing what a great job they're doing. And I just leave and I leave the meeting and I come back here and I do a really a great job for our patients. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying, to be quite honest with you, it's amazing how and maybe I'm guilty of this too, how these surgeons that are doing all these fusions are believing that they're doing what's best for the patient when they really aren't, when they haven't invested in learning better techniques for their patients and they just keep putting metal and fusing, right? I'm sure in the anesthesia world, you guys have the same thing, right? anesthesiologists that still use nitrous oxide to put people to sleep <laughs> when there's actually propofol <laughs> well versed and fentanyl right you could use versed and fentanyl it's, it's old-fashioned it's cheap it's been around forever or you could use a state-of-the-art drug like propofol but, um, you know, anyway, we're just kind of laughing and chuckling at how, you know, disparate there is uh, in, in uh, how people get treated by doctors. All right, there's the incision. Just resistance. No bleeding. They may have a little bruise um, tomorrow from the little vein, but nothing, nothing to be worried about. So another successful Duke laser disc repair. Thank you, everybody. Great job. Go ahead and type up your questions while we run this next video.
uh, showing you the difference between a fusion and a Duke laser disc repair. And I'll come answer your questions. Duke laser disc repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with a Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home enjoying life with a very fast recovery allowing normal activities without pain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. 
The Duke Laser Disc Repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke Laser Disc Repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke Laser Disc Repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke Laser Disc Repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. In fact, most Duke Laser Disc Repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. Can I see me? Yep. Looks good. All right, and this is Dr. Duke Majan. Um, we have an old saying in the South, banging them out today, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so we're done with number three. Mm -hmm. We have one more to go. The next patient is a lumbar. So we're gonna mix things up a little bit, kind of throw you off the scent. Um, we did three necks, three cervical spine problems with herniations, and we're gonna go to a lumbar. The next patient has, um, a herniated disc at L23 on the right, and he's got back pain going into the front of the thigh on the right. Then he's got the L5, um, no, L45 with bilateral herniations. I don't know what's going on at 3-4. He may have had back surgery. We'll have to look when we get in there. He may have had a fusion done at 3-4. I'll just have to see it when I look at the MRI. But anyway, getting back to the one we just finished, this was a, a cervical disc herniation. It was C4-5. We went from the front, we went through the disc, leaving the disc alone. We got to the back where there's a tear in the annulus and through that tear, the jelly in the center pushed out and made a herniation. If you go back to the beginning, you can actually see where we did the discogram, injected the dye into the center of the disc. It leaked out through the tear in the back and went and, and, and you could, it could highlight around the herniation you saw what we call in the business a negative shadow which was the the lump where there wasn't dye and it was dye was not there so it was whitish color we got the double shadow uh, i think there as well when we actually went inside the disc with the endoscope we found the tear in the in the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament and I got to be honest with you, I mean, we don't see a lot of tears through the posterior ligament. Um, maybe 10% of the herniations, maybe 15 at most, have a tear through the posterior longitudinal ligament where the herniation is sitting on top of the spinal cord. And that's what we saw today. Now, the MRI that she had done didn't really show that. It showed a smaller herniation. That's why you cannot trust MRIs. They don't give you enough information. And especially when you have a radiologist who doesn't know what he's doing, reading it, or she, I don't want to discriminate sexual, you know, uh, gender-wise, a radiologist, he or she, they don't know what they're doing, right? So um, they, they miss those things, and they don't call them because 
let's face it, the MRI's got a lot of information on those pictures, and they're going to focus on what they think is important. And if they don't see a big herniation, they're just going to leave it out. And so a lot of people's MRIs are what we call under red. Under means not like all the details aren't included. Under red. And it's in the business, it's known as being under red. So I don't rely just on MRI reports. And when people send their MRIs in for me to do an MRI review to figure out what's wrong, I don't just look at the MRI report and, oh yeah, this is what you need done. No. If I did that, I would be an abysmal failure of a surgeon because my patients would still have problems and be in pain because radiologists miss stuff all the time. You need to really have a good surgeon's eye to know what's fixable, what needs to be fixed, what you can help the patient with. And that's why surgeons look at their own MRIs. Now, not all surgeons are able to see what they need to see. And a lot of surgeons, you know, just rely on the radiologist, which is a big mistake. And that's why, honestly, that's why there's so many surgeries with bad outcomes. That said, we could see that this herniations were sitting on top of the spinal cord. We zapped them out with a laser and we cleaned up the back of the disc, cleaned up the tear side to side. She had a herniation on both sides, right and left. The left one was smaller. You saw that it was like a little nest of herniation and the right side was big, the right paracentral and the right foramen. So I was very happy we got everything done. I think she's going to do wonderful. We lost half a milliliter of blood. Really pretty standard stuff. We did nothing exciting about the surgery. Her neck anatomy was perfect. I was able to get to the spine easily. And um, yeah, pretty standard stuff. So I'll take your questions. But um, just remember Duke Spine Institute does have an app. And it's free. We don't charge for it. You can go download it on iOS or Android. Uh, it's available by phone or computer. It has a lot of useful information. We also have our website where you can learn a lot about the different conditions that cause pain. But herniated discs cause 80% of spine pain, whether it's in the neck or back. If you have chronic back or neck pain, it's coming from one or more herniated discs 80% of the time. All right, we have a comment and two questions. The first comment comes from uh, Dr. Uh, Alzhami once more and he said again from Dubai amazing job doctor God bless you thank you Dr. Alzhami you are amazing for um, watching and learning uh, because honestly more doctors need to learn the new technology so they can help their patients better and the fact that you're watching and learning tells me you care and you want to help your patients get the best care possible so thank you and and our greetings to Dubai and by the way, I hope you're hearing me. I'm gonna be in Bahrain. Um, and honestly, I don't know how far Bahrain is from Dubai. I've never been over that far. Um, you know, it's the first time I would go. Um, but I, my son will be racing in uh, FIA F3, part of the Formula One race next year in Bahrain. So I will be in Bahrain for the Formula One race and to have my son race uh, as an American driver. Um, so if you would love to meet with me there, it would be an honor to meet you and uh, have you hang out with the team and, uh, and join us in the pit to see what it's all about, to see the racing. So if, if you're interested, let me know and we'll make uh, plans. But that won't be until I think March of 2023. So we've got probably six months before that happens. Awesome. The next question comes from Nucleus on YouTube. Hello, Nucleus from California. And they asked, uh, is there a waiting time period for patients before it's uh, safe to fly home? Does it depend on the flight time or the location of the surgery? Yeah, great question. So Nucleus is asking, Dr. Duke, when you do this outpatient surgeries, is it safe for the patients to fly home uh, after the surgery? And when when is the safest to go home? The answer is, the next day. It is safe to travel home the next day. Uh, as a matter of fact, to be honest with you, you could probably go home the same day, but I'm not recommending that because, you know, if there is a complication, I would want to be here to take care of it and make sure the patient's, you know, taken care of properly. So I don't, I would never recommend a patient to go home the same day, fly home the same day, but, um, you know, if you absolutely had to, you could fly home the same day. 
Uh, that said, I'd recommend usually flying home the next day. And the only reason why you shouldn't fly home the same day of surgery is like I said, we've never had a complication, surgical complication with the laser surgery, never in 16 years, 16 years. But you know, what if it happens that night, some bleeding or something, I would wanna know about it. I wanna be able to take care of the patient right away. So I would not recommend flying home the same day. I recommend flying home the next day. The next question comes from Diana on Facebook. And they asked, uh, what's the best type of, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the best type of imaging to have done? I've had an x-ray, MRI, and a CT scan for my cervical spine. Hi Diana, with the cervical spine problem. The very best imaging to figure out where pain is coming from is a MRI scan. I'll be honest with you, x-rays are um, honestly not that important at all. Um, as a matter of fact, you don't need an x-ray. CAT scans, totally unnecessary as well, unless you've had prior surgery, in which case we wanna see a CAT scan. Or if I think you have a condition that's very rare, it's called OPLL. It stands for ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's where that ligament in the back, remember we saw it in the surgery, if you go back, you'll see the fibers running up and down where the herniation was sitting. Those fibers can be calcified. It typically happens in Asian people, uh, but not usually American. It's more common in Asians like Japanese, uh, Chinese, Koreans. And if you have a calcified posterior ligament, then this surgery would probably not work for you. So. We rarely, rarely, rarely ever see that, but a CAT scan is how you make the diagnosis. So I would not go out and get a CAT scan or X-ray. If you had to pick one test, 99% of the time, the MRI scan is the best. Um, but really most important to make the right diagnosis is not just the MRI. You must have a proper physical exam. Uh, the physical exam to me is most important, equally important or more than the MRI scan. Yes, it's true. I, can, I would never operate on a patient just without an MRI, just based on the physical exam. It would be insane. You, you just wouldn't be able to do it. You don't know where to go for sure. You could be at the wrong place. You would never know what you're dealing with. So the one test that we must have properly is the MRI without contrast. And the, after that, it's the physical exam, which can be done by Zoom nowadays. And that would give me the ability to make the right diagnosis. All right. Um, Dr. Uh, Alshami uh, commented once more. He was like, uh, I would like to invite you to the back. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Alshami, thank you. I would be very happy to come to Dubai. Um, so perhaps, honestly, I don't know how far Bahrain and Dubai are, but I can look uh, at the map and see. And if they're close, then I will come and visit you in uh, Dubai when I come to Bahrain and uh, I'll come over there but I just don't know how far away they are from each other so let me do some research and uh, and I would love to take you up on the offer thank you and then uh, last but not least we have Wanda Jones on Facebook uh, 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 going back to Nucleus's uh, question she, uh, he went, she went what about driving home could you leave the next day as well so one of the questions from one of our viewers is, if you're having surgery like this, are you able to drive home the next day? The answer is yes, you can drive home the next day. Now, if you have a long trip, you have several hours of driving, you're gonna wanna stop your car every hour or two, get out and stretch your legs, take a 15 minute break. But you know there are people who do, do drive home the next day. Um, and we've had people come from all over that drive home. So driving is yes, it's acceptable and possible the next day because you are not going to be on narcotic pain medication. This surgery does not require any opioids or narcotic painkillers, only a muscle relaxer, anti-inflammatory. Uh, and so you're able to drive a car the next day. And we do have an extra question from Maria on Facebook and she asked, does uh, yeah. Does cervical herniated disc become worse if not treated in time? Uh, can it become a serious situation? All right, Maria. Hi. Thank you for asking. So Maria is saying 
when you have a herniated disc, say a cervical disc herniation, and you don't get it treated, what, what can happen, okay? So here's the disc. We're gonna look at the back of the disc where the herniation is. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Yes. So when you have a tear in the wall, the nucleus can push uh, through the tear and get stuck inside the tear and create inflammation. Inflammation is your body basically attacking, attacking, attacking something we call foreign body. Now, inflammation was designed evolutionarily to help you fight infections like bacterial infections or fungal infections or uh, protozoan infections, okay? Not viral necessarily, but more bacterial, protozoan, and fungal infections. And, you know, human beings, like all animals, if we get um, an injury, a traumatic injury usually, then we can have bacteria get inside our body and start to eat us, basically. And so your body's defense against that initial defense is going to be a inflammatory reaction where we have soldier cells called white uh, blood cells, specifically what are called polymorphonucleosides or PMNs. And PMNs are cells that carry weapons, okay? And the weapons they have are uh, chemicals called proteases and lipases, which break down proteins and lipids, uh, which by the way, bacteria are made out of proteins and lipids. So the bacterial membrane or wall is made out of lipids. And so these PMNs show up and they start to release their enzymes right on top of the bacteria, blasting them, blasting them. And the more bacteria there are, the more of an inflammatory response you're gonna have, the more cells that are attracted to that area. These are soldiers coming in, releasing their enzymes, releasing their enzymes, trying to kill the bacteria and get rid of the invaders. Okay, so your inflammatory system has been around for a long time. It's designed to fight off what it, your body considers to be a, a foreign invader. It's all done without you being aware of what's going on. Your brain doesn't control it. It's controlled by your, you know, other things, which I don't want to go into, but what are called cytokines and uh, um, um, like different kinds of chemicals and hormones in your body that attract these inflammatory cells to where the invader is, okay? So it's a war zone where you have inflammation. Now, when you have the, the tear in the back of the disc and the nuclear material pushes through the tear and it, it comes in contact with your blood vessels in the back of the disc where there is blood vessels, then you get an inflammatory response because now your inflammatory system suddenly says, whoa, over there, we have a foreign invader. We have not bacteria, but like a bacteria, the, the nuclear material is very inflammatory. So the infl inflammation comes and it builds over time, bigger and bigger and bigger. And you get all of this inflammation. Well, inflammation causes pain. It causes swelling, pain, redness, and uh, warmth. So four things, okay? So those four hallmarks of inflammation, rubor, calor, dolor, and uh, tumor, okay? Tumor means swelling, dolor means pain, calor means hot because there's blood supply there, bring in your 97, 98 degree blood to that area, and um, uh, rubor is redness. So the inf inflammation in the back of the disc is gonna bring pain. That's the dolor part of inflammation. And so what I do is I go in and I clean out the tear, get rid of the herniation. That allows the inflammation to stop. Your body will stop the inflammation as soon as you get rid of the foreign body. If you have a splinter in your body and you pull the splinter out, all that swelling and redness and pain, it goes away within a few hours, okay? Your body recovers. So what we're doing with the, my laser surgery is I'm going in and removing the, the nuclear material stuck in the tear, cleaning the tear a little bit, getting rid of the inflammatory tissue, and now the disc will heal itself, and it'll heal painless. So if you don't get it done, if you leave it, what happens? 
Well, that inflammation keeps going for years and years and it destroys your disc. And you'll see the bones start to collapse down and you get what's called degenerative disc disease. Now, I figured this out. Degenerative disc disease comes from chronic inflammation that comes from an untreated herniation. And everyone else in the scientific community, doctors, researchers going, we don't know what causes degenerative disc disease. In the Armenian language, we say eshek, <laughs> and it basically means donkey. And it means you're not thinking, okay? <laughs> eshek means the answer is obvious, you just don't see it because you're stubborn. Um, you know, so uh, all I can say is that um, it's a shame that I had to come along and figure this stuff out because to me it's so obvious. If you just pay attention, you'll see the truth. The truth is right in front of your eyes. And uh, unfortunately, all these people are going around saying, we don't know what causes degenerative disease. Nobody knows. It's inflammation. It's destroying your disc over time. Chronic inflammation. So I don't recommend leaving herniations untreated, not just because they hurt and you want to get rid of the pain, you want to improve the quality of your life, but because if you leave the tear untreated without the Duke laser disc repair, it's going to get worse over time. And the disc will collapse, you'll get the herniation will get worse, the symptoms will get worse. All right, that was our last question. Thank you for joining us. We're going to do a lumbar next, and then that will be our last case for today. I think we're back next week. I believe so, yeah. And I don't know what days we have surgery, but maybe Tuesday we have some surgeries. We have to look at the calendar. Um, but thanks for joining. I really appreciate all the questions. Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah. We have surgery Tuesday and Thursday next week. So, and then the week after that, I'll be gone. Uh, we'll be, I'll be with my son in Spain, and he'll be testing uh, for FIF3. So.